Well, good morning. Welcome to Bethel Baptist Church. So glad you could join us this morning on our live stream. Let's begin our service by singing together, On Christ I Stand. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, while mother ground is sinking sand. A higher plane that I have found, on Christ the solid rock I stand. When darkness seems on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the grave. For Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. A higher plane that I have found, on Christ the solid rock I stand. Shall come with trumpet sound. Oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, all less to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Well, good morning, church. We're glad that you joined us this morning, and we trust that you're anticipating God speaking to your heart as we do uh, hear the Word of God preached uh, in a few moments. I want to encourage you. I'm very excited about today's service. In a moment, we're going to sing Standing on the promises and our theme this year at church is standing on God's promises. This is definitely a time when we need to really uh, stand very firm on the promises of our wonderful God. And the reason I'm excited about today is because we are going to uh, the passage of scripture we're going to look at this morning. Uh, really, we're going to hear a very calming promise that God has given us in these anxious days in which we live in. And I don't know about you, uh, but there's so much going on around us, and sometimes that can create so much going on within us that sometimes we just need God to give us a word of calm assurance. And uh, we're going to hear that today. We're going to hear a promise that just can bring some uh, real rest, some real peace, some real calmness. And so I'm excited. I trust that you are wherever you're watching this morning. I want to encourage you uh, to do your best, again, to just remove those things that can distract you. And not just externally, that's certainly important. I know when we sit at home, we can get so easily distracted. It's easy to get up and grab a cup of coffee and all of those things. But I also want to encourage you to remove the internal distractions. Uh, sometimes I think we get home, we sit in our recliner or wherever it might be, and we can kind of daydream a little bit. So try to get yourself in a position where you could say, Lord, I really want to hear this promise this morning and just have you speak to me and really give me great calmness as we uh, hear the word of God preach. Let's ask the Lord to bless, shall we? Father, we do love you and we thank you so much as we just sang. Uh, Lord, as, as your children, we have solid ground to plant our feet on. Uh, and that solid ground is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's found at the cross. And uh, Lord, we're so thankful for who he is. And we're so thankful that, um, Lord, uh, these days in which we live in, uh, everything is still completely in your control. And it's never on the verge of getting out of control. And so, Lord, we may look at some things and think, man, what in the world is going on? But we have to look back at our God and be encouraged and be reminded that, uh, Lord, our God has everything under control. I pray today, Lord, for your people, wherever they're watching, that, uh, Lord, uh, today from your word, do a great, great work of just really bringing some great uh, comfort and some great assurance, and uh, Lord, just uh, this promise that we're going to look at today would just uh, reassure people, it would comfort people, 
And Lord, if there's someone who's tuning in, who never has trusted Christ as their Savior, uh, Lord, they would understand that the promise can be theirs only when they come to Christ. And maybe this would be the day that they would receive the Lord Jesus as their Savior. We want to give you this service. Lord, we want you to receive all the honor, all the glory, all the praise. Help us, Lord, to do just that and help us to be doers of your word today and not just hearers. We'll ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing. of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, standing. Well, we open with, on Christ I stand, standing on the promises. I guess we have a lot of firm ground to stand on. Let me just encourage you at this time, we're going to um, have our offertory, and I just want to uh, uh, just encourage you to take this time to just give yourself to the Lord. You're going to see here blessed assurance, and uh, uh, you know, this is a great song. There's a lot of things in life that we don't have assurance of, but as Christians, uh, we have great assurance, wonderful assurance. You think about John 10, verse 28. Jesus said that when we came to him, he gave us eternal life. He has us in his hand. And I love what he said. No man, that it includes us, nobody can pluck us out of his hand. And that's great assurance in these days. And so let me encourage you. The words will come up on your, on your screen. And just follow along uh, during this time of offertory.
as we sing our last hymn for the day, speak, O oh Lord. I hope that would be the prayer of your heart as we go, as Pastor comes and preaches in a moment. Thank you, and I want to ask you to take your Bibles, if you would, this morning, and turn with me to Isaiah chapter 1, Isaiah chapter 1, the first chapter there of Isaiah. <clears throat> 700 years before Christ. God raised up a prophet in the southern kingdom of Judah named Isaiah. He ministered during the reign of four of Judah's kings. I'd like you to notice the opening verse with me of the book that bears his name, the book of Isaiah chapter 1 verse 1. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, there's one, Jotham, there's two, Ahaz is three, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Isaiah ministered in a period of international tension. Uh, one expositor on the book of Isaiah wrote, Isaiah stood against the rising threat of Assyria and the emerging spirit of universalism that encouraged the formation of political alliances with other Near Eastern nations, looking to them instead of looking to God. And that was just the beginning. Let's pray, shall we? Father, we come before you this morning, and I would just ask, Lord, really for your divine help to help me this morning. Lord, I think it's important that we set the background to really make the, the, what we're going to look at shine as brilliant as it does. So I would ask that you'd give me power from on high to speak with clarity and simplicity and with accuracy 
Lord, to say those things only that need to be said, and, and Lord, nothing else, nothing more. Uh, Lord, I, I would ask at the same time that uh, those listening would, Lord, give uh, really their diligent attention to all of the background, because Lord, it really does, it really does make what we're going to look at come out so bright when we look at all of this. I would ask, Lord, for power from the Spirit of God to encourage people today and to bring a great calmness to us, but yet to give us some very practical pointers and tips that can help us live out what we're going to hear. And so, Lord, the truth is, I have nothing in it of myself. That's every time I stand up to preach your word. I'm thankful I have the privilege to do it. But, Lord, this morning I'm asking you to give me the Spirit of God to fill me with his power, his wisdom. And, Lord, you administer far beyond what I could ever do in my human finiteness and do what only you can do. And so, Lord, I pray that this will be a help and encouragement. It will be instructive. And, Lord, it will be life-changing, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. They need to understand that spiritually, socially, and politically, nothing was right in the southern kingdom when Isaiah was ministering. I want you to consider this at the very outset just this morning. God declared his people to be spiritually sick at this time. Now the first chapter of Isaiah is, I envision it's almost like God's divine courtroom. And he literally invites the inhabitants of the world to gather into the courtroom because he's about ready to indict his people. Now keep it in mind, he's not indicting the Gentiles. These are his people that he's about ready to indict in this divine courtroom. And what he does, he kind of bangs his heavenly gavel and he declares that his people are spiritually sick. For example, as you enter the courtroom and you sit down and you listen to the divine sentence, God declared that his people had rebelled against him. Notice with me verse 2. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken, and listen to what he spoke. I have nourished and brought up children, and notice what they did, and they have rebelled against me. Now, they not only had rebelled against God, but he continues to uh, really pronounce their guilt and declares that they had also been guilty of not considering God. Notice verse 3. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. I mean, he's really saying, you know what? The ox and the ass are smarter than my people. They know who takes care of them. But my people don't even give any consideration whatsoever to the fact that I'm the one who built their nation. I'm the one who brought them this far. They give no thought to that. He continued in his uh, divine sentence and also announced that they were guilty of forsaking him and were described as being spiritually sin sick. Now, are you ready for this? Brace yourself. God even went so far as to compare them to Sodom and Gomorrah and called them a harlot. Let's pick it up in verse 4. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land strangers devour in your presence and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, thank God for that, 
We should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. He's not speaking to Sodom. He's really making the likeness. Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Go down to verse 21 if you would. How is the faithful city become an harlot? And then in addition to all of that, he's still not done. In addition to all of that, their sacrifices had wearied the Lord. Understand this, folks. Religion was practiced. It was actually very popular at that time, but it was not spiritual whatsoever. And God here is going to make some strange, or use some strange language, and he's going to declare, you're going to hear things such as this, your sacrifices weary me. Weary me. You're even going to hear him say this, I hate your sacrifices. Notice verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, notice, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. When you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, this ought to really sober us up, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead the widow. And folks, God's telling them to do those things because they were not doing them. Now, in all of this and in all the background that we're going to look at in the book of Isaiah, God always uh, sheds a ray of sunshine, a ray of hope, always comes through the dark clouds, so to speak. And in this, there is a ray of sunshine. There's a ray of hope that comes through because in all of this uh, degradation, if I could put it to you that way, God extended a wonderful invitation in verse 18. And you need to see it. Listen to what he said. Come now. And let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I want to tell you, that is one of the greatest invitations. God is always eager and desirous to forgive sinful people. Now, with the spiritual sickness came social wickedness, which, by the way, folks, is always the case. You have spiritual uh, wickedness, you're going to have social wickedness as well. And so I'd like to go to chapter 5. You see, at this point, God's work was completely disregarded, morality was distorted, and God's word was despised. And folks, make no mistake about this, God was angry. Notice with me chapter 5, if you would, verse 12. We're not going to read the whole chapter for sake of time, but I do want you to notice verse 12. He said, the harp and the vial, the tabret and pipe and wine are in their feast. Notice this, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. And so what God was doing, what God had been doing was totally disregarded. No one really was thinking much about God. Keep that in mind. They were partying and they were enjoying their feast, but not a whole lot of thinking was being devoted towards uh, their God. Notice with me, if you would, verse number 20 of the same chapter. The God, God says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. I mean, this is what was going on. Morality was completely distorted. What was one time evil was now called good, and what was one time good is now being called bad. And, and really, God says, you know what? Woe to those people who do that. Go with me, if you would, to verse 24. Verse 24. 
Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their root shall be as rottenness and their blossom shall go up as dust because they have cast away, notice this, they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, as the anger of the Lord kindled, God is angry. Therefore, as the anger of the Lord kindled against his people, and he has stretched it forth his hand against them and has smitten them, and the hills did tremble, and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And you know, Isaiah's ministry, in addition to all of this, was always filled with political change, uncertainty, and as we'll see in just a moment, depravity as well. There was a lot of political depravity that was going on. However, God gave his servant hope. Remember what I said? There's always rays of sunshine coming through all of these dark clouds. And, and God gave his servant hope by glorious revealing that no matter who is on Judah's throne, God is always sitting on his sovereign throne. And that had to have given Isaiah hope. I, I do wonder how often in his ministry, in his mind, in his thinking, he went back to what we're going to read. You know, we're, we're all very familiar with Isaiah chapter 6, and it is a wonderful chapter. And this is where we see, for Isaiah specifically, the ray of sunshine, the ray of hope, where, you know, I, I'm, I'm living in all this spiritual degradation, and socially things have gone downhill, and politically, I mean, I've got all of this stuff going on, and he gets this great vision that is this great ray of hope that says, look, it doesn't matter who's sitting on the throne of Judah, it doesn't matter who's sitting on the throne of Israel, or Assyria, or Egypt, or any other nation, it's as if God says, remember this, Isaiah, I am always sitting on my sovereign throne. Notice with me Isaiah 6, and let's begin in verse number 1. Try to picture this scene if you could. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, these are angels. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. I love that expression. All the darkness, mark it down, the whole earth is still full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Now when Ahaz became king, the darkness in Judah was intensified. Go over with me if you would to chapter 7. Uzziah died, and they do skip over here uh, the reign of Jotham, but we come to Ahaz, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 1. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, king of Judah, and then something begins to take place. We're not going to read all the details of his reign and all of that for the sake of time this morning. Suffice it to say that uh, Ahaz was an extremely wicked king who looked to Assyria for help rather than looking to God. God sent Isaiah the prophet to go to Ahaz and tell him, don't do that. But ultimately Ahaz did not listen, and I'm going to tell you it was not good and it was not right. Now let's fast forward to chapter 24, shall we? Chapter 24. Now in the 24th chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah is given a vision of a future apocalypse. Something that hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen, trust me. Because God said it's going to happen. He has a vision of a time when the whole earth will undergo a cataclysmic judgment. Intense judgment. Notice with me verse 1 of chapter 24. Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty and maketh it waste and turneth it upside down and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. 
Go to verse 6. Therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men left. Folks, you need to understand that this will be a time when God will judge all people, no matter what their economic or social status is. All joy will be darkened and the earth, we're going to read this, the earth will reel to and fro like a drunken man. And nobody will escape this judgment. Nobody. Notice with me chapter 24, verse 2, if you would. And it shall be as with the people, so with the priest. And as with the servant, so with his master. As with the maid, so with her mistress. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. The land shall be utterly emptied and utterly spoiled, for the Lord hath spoken this word. Go over with me, if you would, to verse 11. All the way down to verse 11. And I just want you to notice in the middle of that verse, it says there is a crying for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. Go with me, if you would, to verse 17. All the way down to verse 17. Fear and the pit and the snare are upon thee, O inhabitant of the earth. And it shall come to pass that he who fleeth from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit. And he that cometh up out of the midst of the pit shall be taken in the snare. For the windows from on high are open and the foundations of the earth do shake. Go with me to verse 20. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall be removed like a cottage. And the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it and it shall fall and not rise again. However, in the midst of all of this, there is a shout of praise. And that shout of praise is that the Lord of hosts shall reign. He still will be sitting on his sovereign throne even at that moment. Go all the way down to verse 23. Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients gloriously. Now you come to chapter 25. In chapter 25, Isaiah praises the Lord. Notice what he says. He's speaking now to God. O Lord, thou art my God. I will exalt thee. I will praise thy name. For thou has done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. And we're not going to read the entire chapter this morning. But really, Isaiah takes some time here to praise his God. And then we come to chapter 26. It is here, in this chapter, that among all the ungodliness, unrest, and uncertainty and coming judgment, that God gives a guarantee of peace. And how many of you at this point want to shout, praise the Lord? Which also tells me something, that no matter how dark the day may be, no matter how difficult the circumstances may become, and no matter how much suffering we may face, there must always be available to us peace. I'd like you to notice chapter 26, and we're going to begin in verse number 1. And that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. Open ye the gates that the righteous nation which keepeth the truth may enter in. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Very quickly, what I want to do is I want to present three thoughts concerning this guarantee. I know we laid a lot of background, but to me, this promise shines brilliantly against the dark backdrop we just looked at. 
that in the midst of all of that darkness and those storms and all of that depravity and degradation and all of the coming judgment and everything that is going to happen and everything that God said is going to take place, you mean peace is available? Absolutely. And so I want to consider just three aspects of this promise for just a moment. I want you to notice with me, number one, the guarantee itself. The guarantee itself. I'd like you to, this morning, as I have you do often, I, I want you really to look at verse 23 of Isaiah 20, or verse 3 of Isaiah 26, and I want you to just really look at it, read it slowly, meditate on it for just a little bit. It's, it's a glorious promise. I want you to think about the guarantee. As you look at the verse, look at the guarantee. Thou wilt... Not thou will try, not hopefully you can, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. It's a guarantee that God will keep people in perfect peace. How many of you sitting at home today say that sounds absolutely wonderful? Oh, I would love to have perfect peace. You know, most of us live with sporadic peace. Some of us live with no peace at all. That's what makes this promise so wonderful. We can relate. Can you not read all of what we read and say, I relate, I can understand. Boy, I'm living in that day. And yet here's this great promise that no matter what is going on around me, God says, I can have perfect peace. Not sporadic. Not absent peace. I can literally have perfect peace. That's the guarantee. Now here's the thing. Some of the promises of God, as we look at them throughout the year, scattered throughout the year, you need to understand this, that some of God's promises are conditional promises, you know. Now this is one of those promises. This is not a blanket promise that every human being in the world can claim. By the way, it's not a promise that every Christian can claim either. You say, well, how can you say that? Well, there is the guarantee, but I want you to notice, secondly, the recipients. Who it is that God said he would keep in perfect peace. And this is very important. So would you look with me at verse 3 again, all right? And again, slow down and read it and notice the recipients. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Now, you need to notice that the guarantee of peace is given to those who think on the Lord. Now, we are back to our thought life again. I feel like this is where we've been for several weeks, even in 1 Peter. We've been talking about arming ourselves with the same mind. We've been talking about thinking on certain things. And here we are in Isaiah chapter 26. You've heard me say, Scripture has much to say about our thoughts. And here it is again. God said, look, I'll tell you who I keep in perfect peace. It's those who have learned and disciplined to think on me. Folks, the reason so many of us do not enjoy this guaranteed peace is because we spend so much time thinking on all the wrong things. We are so busy and so consumed with meditating on all of the wrong things. And that is why we live with sporadic peace. That is why some of us have no peace at all because our minds are so filled with all of the things that God says, don't dwell on those things. Now, to help us better understand the mindset Isaiah is referring to, we need to understand what the word stayed in that verse means. You see, God said, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. I love this word. It's a powerful word when you look at the definition. It means that our mind is leaning on God. It means that our mind is resting on God. It literally means that because our mind is leaning on and resting on God, this is what it really has as a, as a primary implication. It means that our thinking is propped up on Him. Now we can relate to, can you not see the picture? It's like leaning against a wall when you're extremely weary. 
and you just feel like I need to take a break and, and you lean against that wall. What are you doing? You're leaning against something bigger and stronger and solid to hold you up for just a few minutes of weariness. And that wall is propping you up. And God is saying, you want to know who I keep in perfect peace? It's those people who have learned to mentally prop themselves up on me. That's who I keep in perfect peace. You know, I've discovered in my own Christian life that I often forfeit peace because rather than propping my thinking up on the infinite understanding of God, I prop my thinking up on my very finite understanding. I tend to do the very opposite of what Proverbs 3 verse 5 tells me not to do. And we know, we can quote that verse, but that verse says, lean not unto thine own understanding. Now, again, it's not telling me not to use wisdom and not to think through things that I need to think through, but it's telling me, but don't prop yourself up on your own understanding. You better not do that. And oftentimes I've discovered that the reason I'm lacking peace is because that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm trying to figure everything out. I'm even to the point at times where I'm trying to figure God out. And I begin to drive myself crazy. The truth is, folks, we live with distraught souls because rather than trust God, we're frantically trying to understand what he does not want us to understand right now, or perhaps we're trying to understand something that we'll never be able to understand. We're so busy doing that. I have learned a principle in my Christian life. Sometimes God gives us no further understanding until we obey what he's already told us to do. Sometimes God's not going to help me understand more until I, first of all, obey what he's already helped me to understand. But then I've also learned this. We just have to be humble enough to admit there's just some things we're just not going to know. I mean, Romans 11, verse 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. I've reached a place sometimes in my ministry where I'm not some, so often afraid or embarrassed to sometimes look at me and say, you know, I really don't know. I'll be honest with you, I don't understand that either. And I don't know if I'm going to try to figure it out. Because I think I'll put myself in a sane asylum if I do. I just know it's true because God said it's true. I really don't have any better explanation for you than that. I'm sorry. I'm just a finite human being just like you. <laughs> a Bible commentator regarding or commenting on this verse commented that the Christian life is not an unthinking life of just doing or experiencing, but it is also about thinking and where we set our mind. Let me repeat that. Where we set our mind is essential in our walk before the Lord. Folks, we're the ones who choose where we're going to prop our thinking up. No one chooses that for us. So when I am plagued with anxiety, I'm dwelling. That's what I'm doing. I prop my thinking up on all of the possibilities and all of the things that have me anxious. And God says, you'll never have peace. You got to remove it from there. And guess what you got to do? You got to prop your thinking up on me. Start thinking about me, God. Now, we have the guarantee in this verse. We have the recipients in this verse. You know, the wonderful thing I love about our God is God doesn't just say, that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. He gives us, number three, the reason. Now, let me tell you why God keeps... Now, I'm not going to tell you why. God's going to tell you why. It is these people he keeps in perfect peace, and you need to look at the verse. Here's what he said. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Why will he do that? Because he trusteth in thee. Folks, the reason God gives this guarantee to the one who has mentally propped their thinking up on God is because even though they do not understand everything, they are demonstrating they are trusting him in everything. 
This is the person who can look at you and go, you know what, I don't understand this. I don't know why God is allowing this to happen. I don't have all the answers for this, but I'm trusting the one who does have all the answers. I'm leaning upon the one who does have all of the answers. I don't understand why we're finding ourselves at this time in history, but I'm not losing sleep over it because I'm trusting the one who does know why this is going on. I know that he understands. I know that he has the answers. This is why God says, I keep that person in perfect peace. This is the kind of mental stability Job demonstrated when he said, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. He can take my life, but he's going to do it. If he does, he's going to do it with me trusting in him. And I may not know why he chooses to take my life, but that's okay. I'm trusting him. Now, folks, this is a guarantee given by God. But it's a guarantee given to those who discipline their thinking. We don't like that word. What I'm saying is this, you're not going to get this kind of thinking overnight. You can't just write out Isaiah 26 verse 3 on a 3 by 5 card, stick it under your pillow, and get this through osmosis tomorrow morning. You have to learn to discipline your thinking. So let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a very important question. Wouldn't you like to get beyond enjoying sporadic peace and start enjoying God's perfect peace? Aren't you tired of being tired? Aren't you tired of being in a constant or a sporadic case of frantic panic? And wouldn't you like to get to the place where you say, I'd like to be able to live that promise out? Well, let me just say this. Number one, you'll never be able to enjoy perfect peace until you have first made your peace with God. It could be that today someone has joined us, our live stream, and maybe you're sitting at home and you're thinking, I would love to have that perfect peace. But you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. I'm going to tell you, you'll never have perfect peace until you make your peace with God. You see, God says this, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. And there's a reason for that. He says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So every single one of us, I'm included in this. I am no better than you. I'm just in the same state that you, except for one difference I'll tell you about in a moment. Every one of us has an unrighteous, sinful standing before a holy, sinless, and perfect God. There is no way for us to justify ourselves, to earn a righteous and sinless standing before God, except by repentance of sin and faith in Christ. You see, Romans 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I would say if you're watching today and you've never trusted Christ, that's the only difference between me and you. There came a day when I realized I will never have perfect peace until I make my peace with God. And the only way for me to do that is one day I went to the Lord Jesus Christ and humbly said, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner. I am spiritually dead and only you can save me. My friend, if you're watching today, I want to tell you that is where perfect peace begins and you could receive Christ as your Savior. But let me speak to believers. I want to give you three practical exercises that will help us all discipline our minds so that we can enjoy perfect peace. Because I was serious when I said that a moment ago. You can't get this through osmosis. You've got to make, I've got to make some decisions. Maybe we've got to change some behavior patterns and start doing some things differently to discipline our thinking, to discipline our thought life. So I want to give you three spiritual disciplines, if I could, that will help you, help me enjoy this perfect peace. Discipline number one, purge. You need to purge. Now let me see if I can explain this for just a little bit. Back in the late 90s, it was probably 96, 97, maybe a bit of 98, I can't remember. I was a news junkie. 
I listened to news programs nonstop. I was a radio talk show junkie. I, I cannot tell you, uh, for a while I was painting houses and work eight, nine hours, sometimes by myself, and I had, uh, I had radio talk show on all day long. I listened to Rush Limbaugh. I listened to on and on it goes. And then my dad, I don't know if my dad is still into a lot of those things, uh, but we would sit together sometimes and we'd watch an hour or two at night and uh, some political shows on TV and those kinds of things. And then we would talk about it and everything like that. And I talked to people at church about it who were also in the same kind of uh, boat that I was in, I guess you could say. And I began to discover something, though, as time went on. I began to discover that I was becoming a very agitated and anxious individual. That's really not the way that God wants us to be. Well, if you think about what I was doing, is really what I was doing is for every day of the week almost, for hours on end, I'm just filling my mind with all this gloom and all this doom and all this divisiveness and all this debate and all this anger and all this finger pointing. and That's all I was doing. So I turned it off. It was one of the best things I ever did. Now, I'm not saying that you're a wicked sinner if you are into those things, but I will tell you this, and I, I would strongly urge you that maybe some of us, the best thing we can do is begin by purging our daily intake of news feeds, articles, podcasts, blogs, radio talk shows. Uh, there's an, added, uh, an added, added dynamic to this today that I didn't have in the 90s, and that is social media. Sometimes one of the best things you can do is to just not check your social media for a day or two. You know, social media can become this great storm of disappointment and, and, um, and frustration and insecurity as you're just constantly scrolling through and, 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 you know, oh man, this Christian who used to be this way has drifted and I, I can't, oh man, look at their feed. Theirs is so perfect and mine is so cheesy and you start getting so insecure and you start comparing yourself and what are you doing? You're filling your mind. I would strongly urge you to not watch or read the news or check your social media feeds before going to bed. It always kind of, you know, I look back on it, I think the 11 o'clock news. We watch the 11 o'clock news for 30 minutes and then we wonder why we have sleepless nights. All we've done is we've just gone to bed with a, a mind full of junk, if I could put it that way. Again, debates, division, you know, all this stuff. Wouldn't it be better to just say, you know what, it, 20 minutes before I go to sleep, why don't, I, why don't I read some scripture? Why don't I pray? Or why don't I just read a good book? Purge is a discipline that might be required by some. Secondly, pray. Pray. Now, folks, this is not oversimplifying anxiety. I say this kindly. I get weary of people telling me, you know, when I try to counsel them, well, don't oversimplify this by telling me to pray. I'm not. That's what God told us to do. That's almost like telling God, you're oversimplifying my anxiety because you told me to pray. Folks, many of us are panicked because we're prayerless. And it's God who told us, listen, the cure for an anxious soul is prayer. He said it this way, be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And to me, here's the greatest prayer promise in all of the world. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. See, it is God who said, you're anxious, you want peace, talk to me about it. And so for some of us, we might need to purge. Some of us may need to learn how to pray more. And then thirdly, ponder. Ponder. What I mean by that is learn to immerse yourself in Scripture, not just read it. I mean to immerse yourself in it. To do what the psalmist said in Psalm 1 when he said, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. Listen, and in his law 
doth he meditate day and night. I'm talking about that. Where what you read in the morning, you start to discipline your mind to think about what God said in that passage. Where you can even, he said, day and night, as you go into the evening hours, you take what you read and you begin to think about what God said in that passage during the evening hours. Joshua 1.8 even goes a step further and says that the law should not depart from our mouths. You can meditate on it by talking about it with other believers. I trust family members you share with one another things that you're reading in the Bible, things that you are learning. That's sharpening one another. That brings peace. I'm talking about learning how to not just hear a sermon. And I know I'm preaching, but to just hear a sermon and at the end of this, click your off button and go, well, that was a good sermon. But to take your notes back out at some point during the week and say, all right, let's think about it again. Hey, this is what we were just heard on Sunday. I'm getting anxious. I was just heard a sermon on how to have peace. Maybe it's time to get that sermon back out. And let's rethink this again. This is why, to be honest with you, I don't share this with too many people. And if you do this, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And and it's a wonderful accomplishment. I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's wrong. I don't think it's right or indifferent or anything like that. It's why, I'm going to be honest with you, very seldom do I ever read my Bible through in a year. I just find that I just cannot do it. I just, it's, there's somewhere along the line, it just seems as though God seems to put his finger on something, a passage, a chapter, a book, uh, maybe a topic, a word study, or something like that. He just says, I want you to go a little further with this. And before I know it, if I'm trying to follow a Bible reading schedule, I'm way off schedule. And it's just at that point. But I find that, you know what I do? I grow more if I learn to meditate on what God is teaching me than if I just try to follow a strict schedule and get through it in a year. Now, if people, I know lots of people who do that, and it's a wonderful accomplishment. I would never discourage them from doing it. But for me, it's learning to meditate. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. I wonder if maybe today you'd have to admit I need to do some spiritual, mental discipline. I need to start doing some purging. Definitely need to do more praying. And I probably need to spend more time meditating on the word of God. I would encourage you to do it. And I can guarantee you, because God guarantees it, if you will, you will find peace increasing. But it never will until you learn to put your mind, to prop your entire thought life on him, who he is. Father, I pray this morning that you'd speak to our hearts and, Lord, that this is a wonderful, wonderful promise. But we cannot close our Bibles today and say, well, that's great. I can have perfect peace and think that there's nothing required on our part. Lord, we have to do some, some mental discipline. Some of us, that may mean that we're going to have to do some purging. Maybe some of us who are watching would say, you know what, it's, it's, it's time to maybe turn the news off a little bit or I'm going to spend the next day or two or I'm going to schedule maybe some, uh, I've heard people do it, where they take a social media fast. Maybe for some of us it's learning to pray more diligently than we currently do. Maybe it's learning what prayer really is. Lord, for some of us, maybe it's learning to meditate more on Scripture. Maybe it requires doing, for what many people tell me, the difficult thing, but, you know, memorizing some verses. Spending an entire week in one entire passage. So many things that, Lord, uh, we can do. It's so difficult in this very, very noisy and busy society we live in. But I pray that, Lord, you'd speak to people today. If there's someone who's watching who's never trusted Christ, Lord, we're here to help them. They could call us. They could email us. We would gladly do anything we could to help them understand how to have peace with you through salvation. I pray that you'd be with everyone, Lord, that you'd encourage them. Help us, Lord. In a moment, we're going to sing a song to finish this off that reminds us, oh, I can have such perfect peace 
Not imperfect, not sporadic, perfect peace. But I have to do some things. I pray that you would bless and Lord, you'd be honored and glorified by everything that was done and said today. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let me just um, take a couple minutes here, uh, folks. I just want to remind you, and I'm going to take a few minutes here. I want to remind you that this Thursday at 7 o'clock, uh, we begin our Quieting a Noisy Soul class. Uh, most of you have your workbook already. There's a few of you we have not been able to get it to just yet. Uh, don't worry, we will get it to you. You'll be contacted uh, probably today uh, so that we can arrange to get you your workbook and, uh, and everything of that nature. And so we want to encourage you. I think all of those are out. You'll be getting um, uh, each week, uh, you'll be getting a, a link that will take you to the live stream uh, video class, I guess you could put it that way, uh, so that you can tune in. It's a little bit different than the way you normally uh, join into our live stream. And so we'll be sending you, uh, sending you an email with some instructions on what you do. Don't panic. It's not complicated. It's just we're doing this a little bit differently for copyright reasons. That's really the only reason that we're doing that. Um, but you'll get an email with some instructions on that. And I want to just encourage you uh, to just uh, be ready this Thursday at 7 o'clock. Now, I do just for a moment, if I could, um, I preached today's message on purpose. I, I chose this Sunday on the Thursday before starting Quieting a Noisy Soul um, I, this had been on my heart for several weeks, and I, I, I planned it this way. Uh, because quieting a noisy soul, one of the key components to really being fruitful in it is that we're going to have to discipline ourselves to meditate on the principles we hear every Thursday night. In other words, it's really designed, and we're getting a very skeletal workbook. If you really, if we had the full course, you'd be amazed at what the workbook has in it. Because the key component is that every day from, from you know, so we have a class on Thursday night as you're going to watch. And then Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all the way to next Thursday, you're daily meditating in various ways, certain things that you would be doing in various ways uh, on the truths that you've learned because it's the only way to get a quiet soul. And so that's a huge component of what we're going to do. And so um, I just, for a couple minutes, I want to speak to the men, if I could, who are registered. And men, I want to encourage you, if you're married, to take the lead in this and uh, before Thursday, go to your wife and say, honey, why don't we do this? Why don't we each week set aside 15 or 20 minutes where you and I will sit down with our workbooks, our Bible, and just discuss with one another the things, the principles that God is teaching us. And, uh, and, and just help one another that way. Uh, men, I'm going to tell you, your wife wants you to do that. And um, I would encourage you to do that. And uh, my wife and I did that this morning before I came into church. We were talking about a time where we could uh, do it ourselves and uh, everything of that nature. But I also want to encourage you men to go just one step further, if I could. And that is if you would find a, another man who is already registered in the class. I've also done this. I, I may be inviting a few other men into our, our session as well. If you'd find one other man and say, hey, listen, how about if maybe you can't do this every week, but maybe you could do it every other week uh, dur during the 24 weeks and just say, how about if we just meet and just uh, just share with one another some of the things that we're learning, some of the things that God is teaching us only in quieting a noisy soul. OK, just in those classes, so to speak, the principles that he's bringing out, the things that he's doing. Now, here's the thing. If you, you can do it on Zoom and, and I know how men are because I'm a man. And sometimes we get on and I don't know what to say. You know, the great thing about Zoom is you can schedule a 15-minute meeting. And that's what I would suggest. Because if you schedule for 15 minutes, number one in your mind, we only have 15 minutes, so let's get talking. Let's not waste our time. Let's just get talking. And here's the other good thing. It's just 15 minutes and the meeting is done. So I'm not going into something that's going to require me for hours. Ladies, I want to encourage you to do the same thing. I, I address the men because ladies seem to be a little more wired that way. They seem to be a little better. They, they talk more. I don't know what it is with us men. I don't know if we just think we're too macho to open up and share a few things. I don't know. So I would encourage you ladies to do the same thing. But, um, and here's why I'm encouraging you to do that. God does not want us to just take in. 
and then just let it sit there. He wants us to take in, and then he wants us to grow. So I'm hoping as we take it in, we're going to begin to grow. But he doesn't want us to just grow, and that's it. As we grow, he wants us to give out. As I'm growing, God says, I want you to help somebody else to grow. And that's why I'm trying to get you to sit down and just share with one another the things that you're learning. Be much in prayer for this Thursday as we do begin. I really believe if we go into this prayed up, your heart open, your heart tendered, I really believe that God will begin to really give us a quiet soul. And that's my prayer for everybody as we do take this class. That in mind, we're going to sing uh, just before uh, the close of our service, we're going to sing uh, one verse of Like a River Glorious and just be reminded that we can have a quiet soul as well. We love you, church. We hope you have a great week. God bless you, church. You're dismissed.